paper I'm talking about. Uh, so this is known as LED array microscope. Uh, it's approximately 10 years old now uh, uh, since its invention. And so what it is, is you start with a center microscope. So then you replace the illumination units, uh, which typically is a lamp with a programmable LED array. So what this allows you to do is to turn on any arbitrary illumination patterns, either one or some pattern illuminations. So then the question is, what can you do uh, with this kind of pattern illumination? So since I joined BU, so primarily I have been working on, we have been primarily working on two uh, different imaging modalities. One is for 3D face imaging or face tomography. Uh, the other I will not talk about primarily working for 2D, but, but for high throughput imaging uh, cellular uh, microscopy. All right, so, so turning on to the space tomography uh, problems, in particular in, in, the, in the field uh, working uh, in, uh, in optical domains, we, we term this, uh, we, uh, uh, one terminology used is known as intensity diffraction tomography. Uh, so the idea is that you take data, something like this, uh, as the movie uh, shows, you can, if you are turning on the LED one at a time, so each of the LED is actually corresponding to an illumination angle. So what happens is that you see this perspective change from the intensity measurement. So this suggests that there is uh, 3D information that encoding this intensity data. And uh, uh, as I was mentioning at the beginning, uh, because our final goal is to, to recover 3D face information, the entire process also uh, encodes a face retrieval and inverse scattering process. And the key thing is that all this entire process uh, is take, uh, taking from uh, this simple setup does not involve any interferometry. So what it implies is that there is no direct phase measurement. So we'd have to solve uh, the phase retrieval problems as well as the 3D tomographic uh, inner scattering problems all in a, a single, uh, all in a single holistic uh, framework. So I'm gonna go through a very different model-based technique first, just so that you can set up your intuitions on what the problem is and how do you think about the information encoded in this, in this measurement? And then later progressively talking about more uh, complicated aspects in this, in this problem. To start with, I'm gonna talk about this very simple idea uh, that uh, based on the famous firstborn approximation, this results in a linear model, uh, we call it the, uh, and uh, uh, the firstborn approximation actually assumes so-called single scattering approximations. Uh, so the idea is something like this. So if you have a 3D object as I illustrated over here, then um, because they are weak scattering, so essentially what it means is as light going through the sample, so the light will only scatter once by these scatters, which are denoted by these plot dots. So what we do for modeling purposes is we discretize the sample. Uh, in this case, uh, a bunch of uh, axial slices Per, uh, perpendicular to, to the uh, optical axis, uh, which we call a Z axis. So then uh, what we do is to, to uh, look at the information encoded in the uh, intensity measurement. Uh, so without going into too much details, so the key insight based on this uh, uh, linear approximation and by looking at the intensity measurements, what we see is the following. So by looking at the spectrum, uh, the intensity measurement actually can be decomposed into four terms. The first term is the DC term. So what I show on, on the right of the screen is the corresponding Fourier space picture to show you where the information is encoded in the Fourier space. So uh, the first one is the DC term. So that corresponding to this unlike red dot. So the, uh, the second and third term, they are conjugate to each other. Uh, they are actually corresponding to the first order scattering informations. And uh, their, their uh, uh, Fourier space coverage actually corresponds to a single simple circle because they're complex conjugates. So you see a pair of circles. Uh, the circle is coming from the fact that for a linear optical system, uh, it acts like a low pass filter in 2D, uh, and the low pass filter is a circular. So the final term is actually the autocorrelation between the scatter scatter term. Uh, so that will uh, encompass uh, a twice the bandwidth of, of, um, of the imaging system. So what we do is we can simply do a background, what, background subtraction to remove the DC. And also if we can neglect the, the scattering scattering term, which under the weak scattering or single scattering approximation, this holds. 
So then we, are, we can arrive at this simple linear equation. Um, so to demonstrate this actually works. So this is just to, uh, to show you that with the data I showed you at the beginning of the talk, uh, and by looking at intensity spectrum, indeed you can see these two sub, uh, spinning circles. So you see that uh, indeed uh, under uh, this approximation, uh, we can very well capture the uh, imaging process. So if this is a true, so what we can do is actually to, to essentially model the entire linear process. So to briefly, uh, you can model the 40 uh, transfer functions as a function of uh, both uh, the axial dimensions as well as the illumination angle theta. And since we have both absorption and phase, so it goes with um, in, in both cases. So then once you have the 40 transfer functions, you can just pick your favorite linear deconvolution algorithms and recover the phase absorption. In our case, uh, simple Tikhonov deconvolution was, uh, was sufficient to recover images like this. And to show you this really works. Uh, so this is uh, the first experiment demonstration uh, my student uh, Raylon did about uh, four years ago. Um, so what you see on, on your top left, this is an image that you, you see actually from a different objective based contrast image to provide uh, quote unquote ground truths of the features you are expect to see from these cellular clusters. Uh, so then on the right, we are labeled as IDT, this is our measurement. Uh, they are typically shown in these uh, uh, jet uh, color scales. So you can see that looking at different individual cells, indeed we can recover the correct cellular features. Uh, so then looking at uh, more complicated cell cluster regions, and stepping through different uh, regions, where for PHC, this uh, conventional technique, if you wanted to look at different cellular regions, you have to manually move the stage so that you can look at different cellular features. Well, on the other hand, by using our technique IDT, all you need to do is to scan through different illumination angles. No scanning is, is needed. And, to, to, and by, by the simple uh, deconvolution technique, you can recover the correct cellular features. Okay, so that's the sort of the premise of uh, we're gonna talk about uh, later. Uh, so essentially this linear model builds on uh, some of the later uh, ideas I'm gonna talk about. Uh, but based on this initial development about four years ago, uh, we observed that there's a key limitation with what we have achieved so far. Uh, so in particular in our application uh, for designing this kind of uh, microscope, we care about five different parameters. Uh, one is system design, so we need to, to be simple so that eventually a broader research community can be adopt, can adopt our technique. We care about reconstruction quality, the object complexity, and we also care about imaging speed and the computational simplicity. So in particular, I'm going to talk about this issue of speed. Uh, so uh, in the technique we, I just talked about, just like the one of the movie I showed you earlier, it actually involves quite a bit of scanning of illumination angles. Although I claim it's simple, but it actually takes quite a bit of time. Uh, for example, when we're trying to apply this technique for a live sample, in this particular case, it's known as C. elegans, so it's one kind of uh, developmental biologists love to study this kind of worms. Um, so what happened is that because of the worm is live, as we scan through the LED one at a time, you actually see that within a single data set, the worm already moved quite a bit. In other words, the motion blur becomes so severe if we only, you know, if we use the technique that I just talked about, we will not be able to, to correctly reconstruct this really information from, from this sample. So what I like to do is to devise different methods uh, in order to, to achieve uh, dynamic uh, live sample imaging uh, with, with minimum uh, motion artifacts. Uh, at the rule of thumb, for, for this kind of biological process, what you need to do is to achieve a data rate uh, about 10 hertz. In other words, uh, we need to capture each frame at, uh, at uh, point 0.1 seconds. So how do we do this? So we came up with actually two ideas. So the first idea is, is using the concept of multiplexing. Uh, so what we do is that instead of turning on one LED at a time, so using the same hardware, but what we do is to turn on multiple LED at a time. So as the movies uh, show here, so what we do is to each time we turn on multiple LEDs, 
but because uh, for the single LUD case, as I just described, it's a linear process, you can actually just uh, linearly combine all the different informations from different LEDs and uh, still uh, approximate the entire process to be a linear process. Although more and more multiple scattering in fact become prominent as you, as you multiplex more LEDs. So this idea came up uh, by my students, Alex Matlock. I've shown it works really well. So for the first time allowed us to, to achieve not quite 10 Hertz, four Hertz uh, frame rate. Uh, and so in this example, and so Alex was able to uh, image C. elegans embryos. Uh, and in this case, these two embryos actually uh, going through two different uh, stages. So you can appreciate the complexity of this dynamic process. So the other example is to zoom on to even smaller features. So to, to looking at single bacteria uh, in, uh, in single cells. So because of the fast dynamic uh, process we can capture using this device, uh, we can track single cells in 3D. Okay, so, so that's with uh, this uh, LED array that involves uh, a, a little bit more complicated uh, setup in that it contains thousands of LEDs and we, we need to uh, also uh, overcome various different hardware issues in order to get it to high speed. So then later through all the uh, previous analysis, we actually figured out that uh, you can actually significantly simplify your, your uh, illumination designs in terms of hardwares, and which in turn allows you to, to dramatically improve the imaging speed. Uh, so, uh, so the setup, the new setup uh, we came up with uh, is shown on, on the right. So essentially what we do is to replace this uh, large LED array uh, by the simple uh, LED rain. Uh, so then what we do is to turn on uh, this uh, rain LED one at a time. And uh, in particular, um, uh, the position of the LED ring has to be placed at, a, uh, at an angle such that it, it, it matches the illumination angle, which uh, in this case, corresponding to the incident spatial frequency that uh, onto the object. So this spatial frequency has to match with the bandwidth of your imaging system. Uh, so you can actually show that this is the optimum way to, to capture the spatial frequency information. So the bottom is this is an illustration of the corresponding 2D uh, uh, free coverage, although it's a 3D problem. So this is just as an illustration that by using a very simple ring geometry, at least in 2D intuitively, you can capture this, the cover the, the uh, free space very efficiently. So uh, what this allows us to do is if we reduce the uh, uh, LED usage to be eight for each uh, data volume, you can, we can actually uh, achieve volume rate of 10 Hertz. So with this new uh, hardware uh, development, uh, so this is an illustration of the data we took uh, and also the corresponding free spectrum on, on, on HeLa cell sample. Uh, again, you see this characteristic double rain uh, features, as I mentioned at the beginning, uh, and uh, indeed, as shown on this fixed cell samples, we can still capture high quality subcellular features throughout the volume. We can also extend this to uh, on very complicated uh, organelles. So this is a fixed C. elegans. So you can see that although with a simpler uh, hardware design, we can, we can still uh, observe uh, subcellular features uh, throughout the entire uh, volume of, uh, of this organelle. So the key developments of, of this, as I mentioned at the beginning, is to really pushing the speed uh, uh, so that we can capture dynamic uh, cellular uh, biological sample. So this is a, a demonstration of the new capability enabled by this hardware. Um, so what you see is a live C. elegans. Um, uh, so with the 10 Hertz volume rate, we can clearly uh, capture the dynamic process uh, while the C. Um, elegans is freely moving. Uh, and uh, you can also appreciate the details that can be captured by this uh, uh, 3D imaging process. Okay, so, so one, uh, one other thing uh, my lab is uh, uh, actively pushing is this idea of open science. Uh, in particular, both we, we try to share our uh, results both 
power designs as well as computation algorithm to the greater research community. So one uh, nice uh, outcome from this is that because this uh, uh, ring LED based or we call it annular IDT becomes so simple, uh, it's actually very easy to be adopted on other platforms. So, so this is demonstrated through a collaboration with Benedict, uh, who was a, a PhD student back then in Leibniz Institute. So he was a visiting student in my lab for, for two months. So later he, he was taking on this uh, now ERC funded project uh, UC2 uh, for open source modular microscope toolbox. So IDT becomes a standalone toolbox in the uh, UC2. So this is a quick demonstration about one year ago. Uh, you can actually take the images on the top right and, rec uh, and perform simple uh, uh, algorithm reconstruction on 3D uh, on cells with the setup as shown in the middle. All the components are 3D printed and you can see the LED rings in the middle and the images are taken with the cell phone. Okay, so that's all about the single scattering model, but let's talk about what's the limitation of this. So primarily, if you put everything together uh, as I talked about uh, so far, IDT stands for the original technique, MIDT is this multiplexing idea, AIDT is this ring LED idea. So uh, what we see is that although we can uh, push in the speed and simplify the, the system design, uh, still the, the one fundamental issue is that the system still cannot uh, recover a very high quality reconstruction when we come to a uh, complicated object. Uh, so in particular, there are two primary factors that are limiting the imaging performance. One is that um, if we image objects that have higher and higher refractive index contrast, the same first that the scattering becomes more and more, uh, becomes stronger and stronger. Uh, we see that uh, the fidelity of the reconstruction becomes lower. The other aspect is that because of the particular system design, it suffers from so-called missing cone artifacts. Uh, so this gives rise to reconstruction that have these sort of tails along the, uh, the D-axis. Uh, so that uh, uh, limits uh, the, uh, the optical sectioning capabilities uh, for very fine detailed structures along the axial direction. So to, to try to solve these problems, the first thing we, we tried recently is actually pushing the uh, accuracy of the, the four model. So as I mentioned, uh, so far with, with the previous techniques, all the models have been based on the first-born approximation or single scattering approximation that leads to this really simple uh, uh, linear uh, model. On the other hand, uh, the, uh, the assumption I made uh, necessitates that the object has to be have a very uh, small uh, refractive index contrast. Uh, and also you can see that based on the very simple derivation I, I mentioned at the beginning, it actually involves ignoring quite a few terms. And these terms become prominent as the scattering becomes more, uh, become stronger. So we do first, uh, is to, uh, to develop a rigorous multiple scattering model that is still computationally efficient uh, and it also is applicable to uh, so-called high NA uh, geometry. This has to do with the fact that we're shining light from very high angles and in this microscope and also capture with, uh, with a, a high NA uh, microscope objective. So the particular techniques, uh, particular model we use uh, is known as uh, split step non paraxial beam propagation method, uh, short for SSNMP. Uh, so this was developed by my student, Jade Drew. Uh, so what we show is that um, this model from a, first, a four model perspective is very accurate uh, to model this kind of high NAIDT measurement and it's reasonably computationally efficient and uh, can be scalable to large scale uh, reconstructions. Um, so just to give you an idea of why this kind of nonlinear model can be more accurate. Um, so uh, so what, it, what we do is uh, to uh, treat the 3D volume um, like this, and then we discretize into a bunch of slices. So then instead of uh, treating them each slice, uh, slices as independent, what happens is that in this SSMP model, we actually model the inter-slice interactions 
uh, based on scattering model. So in particular, what happens is that as a plane wave coming in, this will correspond to one particular LED illumination. So the light will uh, recur going through this recursive process that undergoes uh, essentially local scattering and propagation. Okay. So this recursive process. Uh, so essentially you have the same uh, operation Q and P, Q is this local scattering P, it's propagation, size by size. By size. So um, uh, you, one can actually rigorously prove that based on some, some theory uh, developed 40 years ago, show that uh, this can be very accurately models the, the uh, entire multiple scattering process. So you can go through all, all, all of this throughout the entire volume and finally uh, compute the output field from this 3D volume. So once we do that, we also need to model the, the propagation of light through the microscope. So going through all of this, you can, can imagine we can actually build a four model. So once, it, when, once we have a four model, plug it, this into a standard optimization procedures, which contains the data fidelity term, which I just described, and some regularization term. Uh, in, the, in the case I will show you in the next slide with the result are used are solved by total variation minimization. So you can you can solve this uh, optimization problem through a through a iterative procedure similar to FISTA. So this is a result you uh, you came out uh, from the Seattle sample, which was the most scattering sample we have seen so far. Um, so this is a result you see. Uh, uh, so basically, what you see is that um, the the features subcellular features. Uh, in, uh, in the volume becomes uh, more clear, uh, which indicates that indeed uh, by uh, more accurately uh, model the multiple scattering, you can further push the accuracy of the reconstruction. And you can all, we have also shown that because the scalability of the, of the uh, algorithm, you can actually apply this to, to the dynamic sample and uh, uh, obtain a very consistent time uh, consistent reconstruction. Uh, throughout the time series measurement. Okay, so nevertheless, uh, throughout, uh, based on this recent exercise, uh, I'm pushing the accuracy of the four model, we still uh, observe that there are two primary limitations uh, from uh, further pushing this uh, uh, algorithm to, to wider adoptions. One is that, uh, so I mentioned the, there are two primary factors of limiting the, um, the accuracy. One is the inability, in, inability to, uh, to uh, model the uh, uh, multiple scattering effect uh, by the linear model. This is solved by SSMP model. On the other hand, we have observed that uh, even with this better model, the missing cone artifact still, uh, still uh, is prominent as shown uh, in this zoom in regions uh, on your right. So the other aspect is that um, I mentioned the, the algorithm is fairly scalable. So for example, for typical reconstruction, I, I show you uh, in the previous slide, uh, we're looking at uh, a data volume of a thousand by thousand by 150, 150 is in the axial directions. It takes about five minutes based on some uh, very nice uh, up -date, uh, Code optimization on GPUs by JetPay. Uh, so, but still, um, it takes five minutes. If it takes five minutes to recover uh, one volume, uh, and typically for for experiment like this, uh, we have thousands of frames need to rec recover. It still adds up. Um, so the question is, how do we um, bridge this gap to further push the image quality? Uh, and as well as cutting down the computing time, while we'll, we'll still uh, taking advantage of all the good things I've talked about, uh, meaning that um, using better and better physical models can uh, inform better reconstructions. So this leads to the, the uh, very last topic I'm gonna talk about. Uh, so so the, the main theme is that we're gonna uh, develop a, a deep learning model uh, for better quality uh, IDT reconstruction. In particular, uh, this deep neural network developed by Alex uh, uh, have this key insight that we're gonna train, in, train this uh, neural network entirely based on simulations. And the simulation is based on the multiple scattering model as I just described, uh, based on SSMP. 
uh, and through extensive numerical studies, which I won't talk about, uh, we have shown that this physical model actually uh, provides very good statistics when we compare with these uh, simulated objects versus what we actually capture in the experiment. So because of this and, and a few other tricks, which I will describe, we show that once we train this network entirely on uh, uh, simulations, we can generalize this model to experimentally measured biological samples and also uh, across different experimental setups. Okay, so as I mentioned, how does this work? Uh, what, we do, what we do is to train this uh, uh, model entirely based on simulations. And also, uh, uh, as you know, I probably know that uh, to get uh, a database uh, with you know, cells or sialogens or, or you know, some other biological sample is fairly difficult. What we actually do is, it's not looking for specialized um, biological database, if you like. We actually use natural image database widely available in computer vision community. So then uh, Alex devised a, a process to, to merge these images into, into 3D volumes and then send this to, through this uh, SSMP multiple scattering simulator and to simulate IDT measurement. So once the, the measurement had been simulated, so we do in a nutshell is, what the network do is first apply this IDT measurement by the single scattering uh, dec uh, deconvolution algorithm, as I described in the first part of my talk, so which I will call this sing single scattering physical proximant. So the reason is that uh, uh, I mentioned uh, fundamentally uh, the process is nonlinear uh, because of the nonlinear pro non uh, multiple scattering process. So this single scattering version cannot be simply uh, described as the pseudo inverse of this process. And in fact, if you look at uh, the single scattering model based inverted 3D volume it still contains multiple scattering uh, artifacts uh, along with some other artifacts we have mentioned. So then the idea is that then we're gonna feed this uh, approximate, approximate volume into a neural network. So the network will try to uh, learn from the simulators uh, these multiple scattering physics. So then uh, we can uh, eventually recover a uh, high uh, quality uh, 3D object. So again, uh, emphasize that this entire training process is using these natural images. Um, so then once the network is trained, uh, we, have, we apply this to experimentally measured IDT measurements, which in our case, all biological samples. Uh, so going through the same process, uh, which I will show uh, the uh, improvements uh, in, the, in the measurement. So, uh, so I mentioned there are a couple of tricks we figured out in this process. So, so uh, there are two things I'm gonna, gonna mention here uh, in particular that played an important role. One is that uh, typically, if you think about this uh, entire process that involves uh, going from a 3D to 3D, we think that the process is very complicated and it's a large scale. So uh, it inevitably will involve a large uh, training data requirement and a, lo a long um, training time. So to cut down this uh, computational cost, what we actually came up with is actually this 2D uh, neural network. It's modified uh, from the original 2D unit. And so what we do, uh, the key thing is that we actually input the 3D uh, volume as feature maps as an input so the, the idea is that by this way, we can actually treat axial slices uh, as, uh, as a feature map so that the network will, will try to learn the axial information uh, through these, uh, this process. So the output is actually a, a 2D slice. So that corresponding to the central slice from this input, uh, input volume. So what we do is uh, to fit in a block of, uh, Axial slices as the input. So uh, recover the central slice, then move on to the next block and uh, recover the, the next slice. So then finally, the entire volume is actually recovered slice by slice. And we show that in this paper um, by Alex. This process not only is very accurate, but also this process is actually very efficient to, to encode the depth information. So the other aspect is about generalization. In particular, um, this is related to data normalization when you train neural network. So in our, in our uh, case, uh, we 
have unknown uh, 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 objects with different refractive index contrast range. So this initially posed some challenges uh, when training the network so that they can uniformly uh, uh, recover the refractive uh, or object features both with low contrast and high contrast. So, uh, so later what we figured out is that uh, in order to sort of homogenize the data, what we really need to do is trying to come up with a ways to uh, normalize uh, the input to the, to the network. In particular, what we do is actually going back to the, the single scattering model where we, we draw the insight from there. What we see is that um, by looking at the, the information contained in the intensity spectrum, uh, what we can do is to find approximate linear fit between the underlying refractive index contrast and the, the energy contained in the, in the frequency band. So correspondingly, uh, Alex did this linear fit using this coefficient obtained from the simulation and to correspondingly uh, compensate for, for the linear scaling uh, in, the, in the data. So once we do this data pre-processing as the input, uh, we can actually show that the network can now, once trained uh, without doing any modifications or transfer learning, whatever process, can be uniformly applied to both weak scattering and, and highly scattering uh, objects with high fidelity. Okay, so with all, all that stats, let me show you the result we got. So all these uh, data sets you have seen before. So on your bottom left, in this case, where I call linear model, these are reconstructions from the annular IDT or the ring LED, uh, ring, uh, LED uh, linear model case. Uh, so you can see that uh, once we do uh, perform this uh, linear deconvolution, you can still see these uh, fringes and uh, defocus artifacts. And once we apply this, uh, uh, the neural network onto, onto this initial gas uh, on your top right, in this case, you can see that um, uh, a lot of these unwanted features have been effectively uh, removed. Uh, so you can see that the background has been uh, effectively rejected uh, and they zoom onto small cellular subcellular features. You can see that uh, the features have been uh, correctly preserved, uh, whereas the features that are clearly out of focus have been effectively rejected. Um, so this is a depth projected, uh, uh, so depth coded projections. You can see that throughout the volume, the, the observation uh, across a single string uh, preserves throughout the entire volume. So next, we move on to a, a, this more complicated uh, a sample, C elegant sample, I've seen several times during the talk. So on the left is uh, actually the reconstruction we got uh, from the linear model. Uh, and on the right is the uh, network enhanced uh, sample, ne network enhanced uh, reconstructions. So two prominent uh, things we observed uh, after this process. One is that the, the major missing cone artifacts I mentioned um, as, as a main limitation uh, from our previous model-based reconstruction uh, now can be effectively suppressed uh, by the neural network. Uh, so the other thing is that you can see uh, a lot of the subcellular features becomes much more uh, easier to observe uh, because uh, most of the, the depth dependent artifact have been effectively suppressed. So this is just a 3D visualization of, uh, of uh, the, the previous uh, linear model reconstructed uh, volume versus synaptic reconstructed volume. Okay, so effectively uh, we have have shown so far is that um, this network allows us to train entirely on simulations based on natural images and can be applied to fairly complex biological samples, both weekly scattering cellular samples and multiple scattering um, single organ uh, uh, organ level uh, samples. So next, I'm going to talk about this generalization to a different op uh, different uh, optical setup. So what happens is that. On the trainings, uh, because we wanted to simulate the entire uh, imaging process, uh, the images are, were actually simulated based on this setup, based on numerical aperture of uh, 0.65 and magnification of 40x. Uh, so then, 
Alex tried this on a different experimentally measured setup that were captured by 0.25 NA and magnification 10X. Um, so uh, uh, what he showed is something like this. Uh, so <clears throat> if you look at the original uh, uh, reconstruction from the linear model, so again, you're looking at the linear depth dependence projections. So you can see a lot of these background haze or diffraction artifacts are present in this uh, projection uh, uh, images. <clears throat> so then uh, once you apply the, uh, the network onto the same data set, you can clearly appreciate before and after you can, all the uh, cellular features have been uh, correctly preserved while um, most of the artifact have been suppressed. So this is just a, a visualization of, of before and after the, the network um, enhancement. Uh, zoom on to some small small features. In particular, this, uh, this sample is known as spiral gyro. So one key uh, uh, feature of this uh, feature is this spiral-like uh, uh, structures uh, in each of, of this um, helix type of structures. You can see that uh, you can actually observe these helical structures uh, in the reconstruction. Okay. So last but not least, um, uh, so uh, finally, we're going to show that uh, this network can also reliably apply to dynamic multiple scattering samples. This is the this live seed again sample uh, you have seen before. Uh, so now you, you're looking at the reconstruction across the entire data, uh, data cube uh, throughout this uh, time series measurement. So what you can see in particular uh, uh, is that this bottom right corner, uh, this is zoomed onto uh, some uh, inner regions of, of, this, or, uh, of, of this, uh, uh, this worm. And you can see that all these muscle structures and uh, intestinal structures have been uh, clearly reconstructed uh, with high resolution and throughout this entire uh, uh, process. Okay, so with that, uh, let me briefly summarize. Uh, so, so basically in, in, in the past 40 minutes or so, I have talked about our uh, effort in the lab to develop different model-based and learning-based strategies for achieving high quality uh, and, uh, and simple yet powerful computational 3D phase microscopy technique. As I mentioned, uh, as our goal is to push this technology not only to be able to handle uh, complex uh, and uh, 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 complex uh, and dynamic biological samples, but also we would like to push the computational complexity and the imaging speed and make the system uh, simple so that eventually uh, this entire uh, software and uh, hardware and, and software package can be easily developed, uh, delivered to uh, different biological uh, labs so that they can impact their bio biomedical studies. And with that, uh, let me acknowledge the students who have actually done the real work. In particular, the, the work uh, I've talked about today uh, done by two PhD students, Alex Matlock and Jerry Drew. And uh, I also like to thank the rest of my group and also my funding from NSF and NIH uh, and also support from Boston University. Uh, with that, I'd uh, be happy to take questions. All right, thanks so much. Uh for uh, uh, Prof. Lei Tian for the wonderful talk. Uh, thanks so much. Um, and I, I think, you know, uh, so after the great talk, I think we can move to the Q&A session uh, since I already see some questions raised in the Q&A part. But before that, I just want to ask maybe for the panel panelists, uh, do, is there any question from our panelists? Okay. Uh, yeah, maybe I, I can ask a quick question first. Uh, I'm actually sure. particularly interested of the last part you, you talk about because I, I'm, I mean, personally, I'm working more on the machine learning side, right? Uh, you introduced this very interesting, uh, uh, like a network, uh, I think you call it DLIDT. Uh, and and mm -hmm. I think you show very promising results for those uh, single frame, uh, you know, reconstruction. And later you, you demonstrate also there's a way to extend to a dynamic, uh, you know, uh, reconstruction. But I wonder, is there any, uh, you know, special design in your, uh, your networks to, 
I mean, on top of a single uh, single frame reconstruction, is there any special design to further explore those uh, correlation between different frames? Because I, I, I believe certainly there should be a strong correlation, right, uh, from time to time. Yeah, that's a very good point. Uh, so basically the short answer is that currently the, the, the network is single frame based uh, and um, so it does not take into account of the dynamic information. So certainly looking into the, the temporal information also encoded into the entire modeling process is it's very interesting direction. And further, I want to emphasize that um, because in practical applications, uh, for example, in, in this case, cellular case, the entire volume only contains a handful of slices. In this particular case, I, I believe was 20 something slices. Uh, so the number of slices is actually uh, ultimately limit, limited by the so of actual resolution of your system. Although you can artificially increase more slices, but, you know. uh, but versus uh, a object like this, uh, C elegance, uh, because it's much thicker, um, so it requires much more slices, uh, about uh, 30 to 40 slices. So in order for this network to be generalizable to to accommodate object with different slices. We, so actually the idea we came up with is instead of recovering the entire three volume, we reconstruct one slice at a time. So, so, so with this network, what we do is, let's say we have entire volume have 20 slices, but the input is only a five slice uh, block. So this block only gives you the neighbor, so the local 3D information. Uh, so the idea is that that neighboring information is sufficient to, to inform the network to, to figure out what is in focus, what is out of focus, what are the multiple scattering information needs to be reassigned back to the object feature. Then the object, then the output is only a single channel output, which is this one here. So that uh, corresponding to the central slice from this five slice input block. So then by do, doing this way, you can imagine you can sweep through this five slice block across, you know, however large of a, a volume you would like to reconstruct. So then corresponding to the output can, can stack up to a 3D. All right, thanks so much for the clar uh, clarification. Um, yeah, I think if there's no more questions from uh, our, our panelists, we can move to the questions uh, raised by the audience. Um, so I, I can see right now there are five questions open up. Uh, maybe we can go go one by one. Um, so the first question is yeah. coming up from uh, um, Pi Bossom, and uh, he's asking about uh, like trade off of computation cost versus model accuracy. Can you elaborate more on this? As GPUs have made EM simulation and analysis very cost effective, uh, near independent of um, uh, FP sixteen, FP thirty two, and sixty four. Um, so I also, uh, you know, invite uh, uh, if, if I not, if I pronounce correctly, Pai Bosong, Bosong to speak. So if you want to ask live, you can also unmute yourself and feel free to ask live. Thank you. I, I appreciate the opportunity. Yeah, I was I was looking. Can you hear me? Uh, yes. Yeah. Yes, we can hear. You. So you made the on that one slide. You talked yes. You talked about trade computational cost for model accuracy, and like I say, GPUs. Uh, have certainly made more for made for more cost efficient computational in, in nearly not completely but nearly independent on precision and there's approaches where you can you can essentially tailor down FP 64 to 32 and, and not really lose accuracy and precision so I wonder if you can elaborate on that are you are you using a CPU based uh, analysis computational analysis there or are you looking at different types of platforms thank you. Sure. So, um, so, so all the entire four model and uh, and the reconstruction are entirely done on GPU. So this is one of the efforts my student Jabe Zhu have done because um, the the accuracy, so the model accuracy here. I'm actually referring to the fact that uh, at the beginning of the development of this IDT model, everything is entirely based on so-called single scattering model. So this inevitably requires us to, to ignore all the multiple scattering facts. Whereas this 
uh, what we call SSMP multiple scattering model. Uh, this allows us to, to account for the inter-slice multiple scattering effect. So this is an entirely different model. Um, but because of the model relies on this uh, inter-slice computations, this kind of recursive process, that adds to the computational cost. Uh, so then the complication was we had to um, account for this process without incur too much of uh, computational burdens. Uh, so then in the reconstruction process, you can actually show it also is a similar recursive process, but um, um, because of this entire iterative process, you have to you know, store all the uh, variables that adds to all the memory consumptions that is needed for this. Mm -hmm. Thank you, and if I can real quick, just as a follow-up, <clears throat> because this is very similar to essentially what we do in ray tracing in, uh, in running those on GPU. And like I say, there's, there's approaches to actually improve uh, the processing anywhere from 30% to 3X. So, it's, so it looks like there's an opportunity in terms of cost uh, in computational performance. Yeah, certainly I, I agree. We are, we are no expert of, you know, really uh, optimizing uh, this to the, to the extreme. So by no means this five minutes is the you know, full extent of how, what we can achieve. Um, yeah, I would be happy to, to know more about how to further improve the speed on this end. But I think one of the take, key takeaway here though is that at least from other observation, uh, even with this more uh, accurate multiple scattering models, unless we can capture higher angle information from, from the microscope, uh, which in our case was limited by this missing cone artifacts, uh, the rec reconstruction is still suffer from these uh, you know, this kind of band-like uh, axial uh, depth dependent artifacts as shown in the bottom. All right, uh, thank you. And I hope uh, a, a profiting answer uh, resolved the question um, from, from Boston. And also thanks for the question. Um, yeah, maybe we can move to the, the next one. Uh, the next question is coming from uh, James. Uh, I also allow James to uh, unmute himself. Uh, James, you wanna ask, ask the question live? Oh, hi, Lei. Uh, for, the, hi, um, for the multiple scattering case using the split step method, at each scattering plane, is it really scattering where every point in there is uh, creating a secondary spherical wavelet and so it's scattering over big angles or is it more like a grin layer that each ray is bent at each layer? Uh, so it's like the difference between turbulence and turbidity in terms of propagation. Right, which, right, which one right. is it doing? Yeah, so thanks for the, the question, James. Um, so basically, I should have put a, a reference there. This is a, one of the seminar work done uh, in 1980, around that time, uh, published in Jose A. Uh, so actually, there in, in this development, uh, so-called beam propagation method, there are two methods. One is just called BPM. The other is called SSMP. In BPM, this is similar to this refraction idea James just, mm -hmm. James just mentioned is that what, it, what you do is treat every single slice as a refractive strain. You do a refraction, so then you do a forward propagation. In this SSMP uh, case, actually what you do is to you keep track both of the wavefront as well as axial derivative of the, of the wavefront. So then what you do is uh, uh, in the, in the scatter, what I call a scattering process, you actually, uh, I guess more similar to the Huygens principle because it involves the, the uh, involves calculating uh, the the corresponding Green's function, um, and uh, in the propagation step, this is this is still the free space kernel. So is it more so, the scattering or the refraction then? I think it's more similar. So in each of the slices, if you look at the underlying math, it's more similar to do a local. Born approximation. Although because the, the model is keeping track both of the, the wave field as well as derivative, it allows you to better compensate 
be better account for both the forward and backward component. This is actually one of the key advantage pointed out by the original author that compared to original BPM, this MP BPM, because it accounts for the, the derivative, it also allows to uh, actually both account for the forward and backward scattering effect and also better account for the angle, high angle effect, which is this non paraxial aspect. Mm -hmm. Okay, thanks. All right, uh, thanks for the question from James and thanks for the answers. Uh, uh, so James, I think you have two, you, you raised two questions. I hope uh, uh, are, are both of them resolved. Well, no, the second one is a different question. Oh, you, 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 want, you want to go ahead and ask maybe? Oh, okay, now or, sure. Yeah. yeah. So uh, with the machine learning stuff, it gave maybe much prettier images. Uh, people, especially in the biological fields, always worry about artifacts. And just like if you crank up total variations too much, it can smooth over small features within the image. And that seems to be what those images look like, that they were erasing these little tiny dots. And I was just wondering, have you confirmed whether those tiny dots it's erasing are real things or just noise that you want to erase? Yeah, that's a very good question. So, uh, so I guess at the high level, it's very hard to give definitive answer whether the network is giving the, the, the right answer. So in that end, we did several things, which I didn't go into in too much detail. One, one important uh, recipe I'm just quickly um, uh, uh, reiterate is that uh, this data norm normalization is what we found is actually very important. Uh, because what happens is if you think about, uh, let's say, take an example of MSC laws we use, what happens is if, if the, what, hap what happens is when you have an object feature that have a high contrast, the corresponding uh, artifacts that have been, you know, finally removed by the, by the network, which, in, which means that it's treated as, as the error, can the energy contained in this error from the uh, uh, large, uh, large contrast features can be can have more energy than the uh, the low refractive index uh, features. So that's was actually one of the primary um, a project a pro problem we we trying to resolve. So in those cases, if you do not do this kind of proper data normalization, we indeed observe very prominent feature removal. So then. Uh, so then the other question uh, aspect of the question is how do we confirm whether this is true? So, so in this uh, preprint, we've actually suggested one method. By no means this is the, you know, the full proof that it works, but this is how it works. So what we do is we feed in the network reconstruction. Uh, so then reapply this SSMP model onto the network reconstructed object. Uh, so that we can compute the corresponding intensity images, and then we will compare this to the experiment. And we compare that both visually and quantitatively and trying to see what kind of features have been recovered and what has been removed. So this is an example, two examples coming out of these computations. Uh, so this is on the first column, this is the actual measurement, uh, and third column is what we are interested in, this is the so learned. So this is using a learn uh, object and reapply the process. And uh, the last column is the difference between these two. So what you see is that primarily the, the contrast is different. This has to do with the fact that our illumination actually is not quite plane wave. It has some weird uh, non-uniformity artifact which we cannot uh, exactly model. So this is evident you can, if you see on these edges and also here there's some prominent been adding artifacts. Other than that, um, uh, if you look at the difference between these two, if you see these features, you can argue this feature has been lost. So indeed, we are, we're suffering some feature loss. Um, so other than that, um, so it's, I guess this is where we, we are at now. So we can, we can use this procedure to, to look at what are the features that are likely being lost during this process, but we do not have a good answer to how to further alleviate this artifact yet. Yeah, another suggestion would be to uh, gather data at a certain resolution, 
process it at half that resolution and see if you can get back to you know, the small features that were in the original resolution to see if the, I see, uh, I see. Uh, you, you could have a ground truth by just, by just a, uh, starting with a higher resolution image and degrading that to the lower resolution and see if you can reconstruct the higher resolution stuff again. Yeah. You could try that. Yeah, thanks. Mm -hmm. Yeah, thanks for the suggestion. We'll, we'll look into that. All right. Uh, yeah. Thanks, James, for the question and also the suggestion. Uh, yeah. Thanks, Lei, for the answer. Um, all right. So maybe we can uh, move to the next question. Uh, I think there are two questions coming from Xin Li. Uh, so, uh, Xin, I also unmute you and feel free to ask live. Yeah. Uh Thanks. Uh, actually, back to just a quick comment about uh, uh, James' suggestion. That's the super resolution problem. Yeah, my name is Xin Li. I came from West Virginia University. Actually, my background is more about image denoising, low level vision, super resolution. So that's the kind of more traditional way looking at these problems. Uh, I have mainly just, I said, my two, my two questions are related. The first one is when we, when I saw, uh, uh, lay some, giving some uh, example, those, some of the training data are come from like, a, you know, photographic images. So I, I guess my question is about like, when you use this simulation in your experiment, there is something called simulated to real gap, right? So basically here, the, the still the, the photographic images are different from the biomedical like microscope images. So this kind, do you see in your IDT experiment, there's still some, you know, this kind of gap, though, you know, like how do you justify when you use similar data, but you can still make this to work or try to hopefully this will work in on the real world data. Does it make it make sense? Yeah, that's a very good question. I, I, I have to say it's, it's a hard question for me <laughs> uh, because uh, the way we under, the way Alex and I came up with this idea actually was from a different philosophy. Okay. Well, mm -hmm. our motivation was uh, because of the lack of large scale um, database from you know, cellular images, we would like to actually sort of quote unquote teach the network to learn features that are, um, right. are fundamentally from this entire IDT uh, process, mm -hmm. regardless whether they are you know, natural images or you know, real biological samples right. we actually right. capture. Uh, whether there's a gap, uh, um, that, that, that's okay. Perhaps, yeah. Maybe I'm, I just, I'm not sure if, if there's something. <laughs> maybe I can just offer some of metric the metric you can point. Yeah, yeah. yeah. From the basically for image com uh, uh, denoise community, we start from AWGN, the white Gaussian noise, and then we try to uh, uh, fill in this gap. So what people have done is to use GAN, use the generative attributes, uh, you know, this GAN to sense to as a kind of way of uh, you know like a noise synthesis. So we can uh, verify the kind of similar noise is close enough to the real world noise. So by analogy, I guess probably you guys can also do something similar. I guess my point is, you know, again, these days can be really powerful, powerful to, uh, you know, as a way of simulating many, many things. I haven't seen any can gain in your current kind of model, but I assume probably you and your student might be working on something similar along that line. Uh, right. So. Um... We, we haven't looked into GAN in, in this particular context, but we did look into for 2D imaging. Okay. Uh, but I guess just to clarify our, uh, the, the kind of problems uh, we were concerned in this framework was that um, when uh, I guess the noise uh, we are concerned about for this kind of problem is this kind of, I would still think a very structured, highly structured object dependent scattering or diffraction type of artifacts. And they are also highly depth dependent and they, they correlate very well with the in-focus features. So the idea was that um, because these are highly dependent on the local in-focus features and also fundamentally governed by the same physical process, uh, perhaps the, the, by, by using you know, non-specific objects, meaning that you know, training network mm -hmm. using natural mm -hmm. images, it's sufficient for the network to, to learn without feeding in the real biology of samples. Okay, okay. Yeah, another question related is, uh, I, uh, I, if my understanding is correct, uh, in your SIMBA, that, uh, that new paper, you have used this uh, uh, DNCN. So basically the, 
like the ResNet for denoising developed by Neijiang at you know, at Hong Kong. Uh, DNCN has, well, I guess again, since I came from the denoising community, uh, it has like, more powerful extensions of DNCN. There's uh, some like, I guess in terms of like a prior. So again, that, the, the results have, you have shown here is are really breathtaking, very nice. It, I'm just wondering, maybe there's some, uh, we can put people pushing better to the, uh, James question in terms of super resolution, in terms of other, try to keep pushing the, like, you know, advanced server art and that might be more powerful network that you might, uh, you, you know, like your student, we can work together if you're interested. Okay. Yeah, certainly. I, I, I agree. Uh, I'm happy to, to follow on after, after the seminar. Uh, in general, I, I think uh, the super resolution idea Jim raised is very interesting. Uh, we haven't looked in, into this this direction at all, actually. Okay. Um, and uh, uh, Simba is one work I, I collaborated with uh, with with Olobag Camilo. It's really the brainchild uh, of of Olobag. Um, I actually didn't show any result from from that work, but I guess one of the common theme there and here is that we it's based on the this what I, what I call single scattering approximation, uh, where I think really really to bridge the gap between what we see image like this plus mm -hmm. the neural network is, is trying to also fit in some multiple scattering information so that it can, so that the, the entire computational engine can handle more complex objects. I think at least that's the direction I think okay. uh, it's promising mm -hmm. based on my experience. Okay, thank you. Actually, by the way, it's a very informative talk. I enjoyed it very much. <laughs> thank you. Yeah, uh, yeah, thanks so much for the uh, excellent question uh, from, from, Shin, from Prof. Shinli and also uh, answers from Lei. Uh, all right, so uh, yeah, I think then we move to uh, yeah, the other questions. I think uh, most of them, actually all of them are coming from uh, Stephen Walk. Um, so Stephen, I also unmute you and if you want to ask uh, directly, please go ahead. Yes, <clears throat> I thought the um, presentation was excellent. And the other questions answered what I was thinking about was the validation of your simulations. So it seemed to me that that was the crux of uh, the questions. That's what it meant. So, uh, so really, I, I don't have anything um, other than trite questions like, uh, can I get a copy of these slides so I can get uh, GitHub, the URL for your, uh, for the source, and um, that's pretty much it. Yeah, sure, happy to. So, so I can I can send you a copy of, of the, the the talk, and I believe the the talk is also will be made available through through a space webinar website. Oh uh, um, yes, so, so where yes, so just a quick comment. So yes, we're actually live streaming this on YouTube. Uh, if you, uh, so, so Stephen, if you want to uh, kind of uh, watch this again, you can always, always log, uh, you know, uh, go to YouTube and go to the uh, official site by uh, IEEE Signal Processing Society, and you can find all of our talks recorded there. Yeah. Okay, thank you very much. And it was, I enjoyed it very much. Thank you. Yeah, no problem. And I guess the, the other thing Stephen mentioned was about the, the GitHub. So, so this, Alex is, is working very hard to clean up the code. It should be should be up there. So, seeing our yeah, my my I, background is uh, biomedical engineering and computer science. So that's why I'm interested in it. I was interested in knowing what structure you were looking at, what organelle, if you could share that, and um, did the depth of the cytoplasm uh, have any impact on your images and the simulation? And how long did it take to train the uh, network? Those kinds of questions. All right, so, so um, I, I basically collab with, with, collaborate with various different colleagues at Boston University and medical schools uh, to image various different things. Um, so in my lab, we don't do not have a primary uh, biological goal, so sort of speaking, um, but we have looked into various different cancer cell lines uh, and C. elegans, um, embryos. Uh, I guess I, I, I guess recently the project had been focusing on improving the image qualities uh, in C. elegans because of a collaboration. 
uh, and uh, how long to train the network. Um, the, the training, because of this is 2D network, I believe it takes less than four hours on the GPU in my lab. Uh, and then the inference is sort of- That's know, very good. Like that's that's yeah. actually not too bad. Yeah. The, the time consuming part is actually the simulation um, because we need to generate a large data set uh, on this. But if you believe, so this data set is, needs to be generated based on the particular um, uh, experimental settings. Although we, we show some generalization across different setup, we still have its own limitations. All right, well, thank you very much. All right, thank, thanks so much uh, uh, for the question from Stephen. Uh, so I think, yeah, so Stephen got several questions, but I think you uh, he actually raised all of them. Uh, so let's see. Uh, yeah, I, I think that's pretty much, uh, yeah, I think there's one question from still from uh, Pipe or some, but I think you uh, he asked live just now. Uh, hopefully, I mean, you guys can also uh, follow up later. Uh, he actually shared uh, his email. So yeah, so I, I, I don't know whether that's a, yeah, because that's very brief. Um, but anyway, oh, so I, okay. I think that that's uh, pretty much all the questions we got in the Q&A session. Uh, again, I would like to uh, express the attitude from our organizers to thank uh, Prof. Lei Tian to uh, you know, give the wonderful talk today. Uh, thank you so much. And also thank all of the audience for attending our webinars today, uh, especially those guys from Asia. I know it's pretty late now. So, uh, so also um, for, for those of you who want to uh, rejoin us, our webinar is actually bi-weekly. So we'll have another one uh, coming uh, two weeks from now. So just stay tuned and we'll update more information on our website very soon.